Production of Real Ag is made possible in part by an underwriting grant from Kansas Soybean Commission, the Soybean Checkoff. It works for everyone. I keep reading about engineered corn, but I don't know what that means. Spring water, purified water, what's the difference? Is imported beef safe for my family? Consumers want to know the facts about the products they buy. That's where Real Ag comes in. From plant to plant and from pasture to plate, Cal Bauer and the Real Ag crew find the facts to help you sort the truth and help you understand Real Ag. Now here's your host, Kyle Bauer. Hi, I'm Kyle Bauer and welcome to this episode of Real Ag. Today we're going to be talking about corn. Corn is absolutely a grass. When you think about grasses, you might think about the grass that you grow around your home. Well, originally, the corn that the Aztec Indian started with is very much like the corn that you would have in your landscape areas around your home. It doesn't look very much like the corn we have today, and it wasn't really all that productive in those days. The Aztecs started working with corn nearly 7,000 years ago. They liked the aspects of the corn because it could be stored and it could be hauled a distance, but the productivity wasn't all that high. It's very high in starch, and we're going to be talking about how the corn that the Aztecs had nearly 7,000 years ago is different than the corn today and feeds so many more people all around the world. Well, corn is part of the grass species. Uh, it's a monocot. And some other grasses you might be familiar with would be the lawn that you have in front of your house. Uh, wheat is a, is a monocot grass species also. And monocots do a great job of taking carbon dioxide, fertilizer, and water and turning it into to grain or forage as well as oxygen. Corn is a grass plant. It actually originated as a wild grass down in Mexico called teosinti and over thousands of years humans have manipulated corn through breeding techniques to basically get it to produce more grain and less leaves. Yeah, the center of origin for corn is actually central Mexico and if you look at that corn it's, it's tall and thin and the seeds actually have little pods around it and it was really designed to disseminate the seed around the area of the corn plant from a yield perspective it'd be very very low yielding but through the the centuries it's been domesticated to compact the ear together to make more grain and to be more responsive to the fertilizer and the water that's uh, provided to it to the point that it's, it's really the dominant crops in, in the world today. It provides uh, mostly carbohydrates for energy, um, but it also contains a lot of vitamins uh, that are essential for, for you know, proper growth with amino acids, niacin, things. And, uh, and so it, it's, a, it's a good energy source for both humans and animals. Um, I'd say the, the major um, different types of corn that there would be would be flint corn, waxy corn, um, there's also a, a flower corn, which is specifically for flour. But the three most common types of corn we typically see here in America would be popcorn, sweet corn, and dent corn or field corn. Field corn is, is the major corn, so when people are driving down the highway or they see pictures in magazines, typically what they're seeing there is the dent corn or field corn, and that, that's the primary corn that we grow in the United States, and that's, that's what's being fed to the animals in, in the feedlots. Corn is a very flexible crop. It's used for many, many things. For many people, when they think of corn, they think of, of sweet corn and it's a very nice food. It tastes good with lots of butter on it, but it really only covers around 600,000 acres within the United States, where if you look at the field corn that farmers grow for feed and food production, it would be like 80 to 90 million acres of corn, and that's really most of the corn that you see in the countryside is really being grown for either a feed for animals, and things like ethanol are now being utilized, or corn is being utilized for ethanol. And I think about a third of the production within the United States now, actually, that corn is going to an ethanol plant to uh, ferment and extract the ethanol. And then having the distiller's grain, which is a byproduct of that process, is going back to the feedlots, 
uh, to the animals and chickens in a very high quality feed. So uh, those are a couple of the major uses. Uh, some other feed, or, or excuse me, food uses would be things like popcorn is another type of corn. Um, we have Indian corn that has different colors on it that's more of an ornamental type corn. Uh, white corn is actually grown uh, in places of Nebraska, Texas, and it's used mostly for tortillas or for corn chips. Uh, if you've ever eaten grits in the south, those will come from white corn. So that'd be another food corn use. And then around the world, there's just lots and lots of different uses of corn. Let's talk about yield. When we talk to farmers, they talk about the yield of their grain, the yield of their corn. What is yield? Well, that's the number of bushels per acre. And a bushel is nothing different than a volume that's much like the bushel of peaches or apples that you might see at an orchard. So you look at the bushels per acre. Well, over the years, the productivity of corn has increased tremendously to the point that in 1941, we had an average yield of 31 bushels per acre. Today, it's nearly 160 bushels per acre. Well, that productivity also reduces the price and the number of calories produced per acre is what really feeds the world and was what feeds people in the United States. That corn is used from everything from feeding livestock to helping extend your peanut butter to cooking oil to your soda pop. Corn is inexpensive calories and an inexpensive feedstuff due to all the technology that has been put into the crop over the years. Yield is a measurement that we use to measure typically an amount of product that comes off of a specific unit. And so what we typically talk about when we talk about yield is bushels per acre. And so it's a measurement to monitor the amount of production we are getting out of a field. And so as a corn producer goes to the field and grows a crop throughout the season, typically what he's harvesting off that crop is the bushels of grain. That's what he sells for typically. And so that's how we measure yield is bushels per acre. And this really gets back to the productivity and a lot of times the profitability of that farm is the amount of bushels that farmer can take off of that acre. When we talk about corn, the terms hybrid and GMO come up. Let's talk about those slightly. First of all, hybrid. Well, I, I think we've been engineering corn for thousands of years, and basically what we've been doing is, is manipulating corn really through traditional breeding techniques to have a plant that is, we can better utilize. Um, more recently, we, we, through new technology, we're using what's referred to as advanced breeding techniques. And, and using that, we can more quickly get engineered corn types for specific uses. Early on, in fact, the women many times were the harvesters of the seed, and they would pick the best ears. And a lot of times that same ear would be used for seed for the next generation. And they really did make some good progress. The really the big advantages to corn is, is that the male and female parts of the plant are in different places. And so when you look at developing a hybrid, the tassel of the corn, the top of the plant that you see, the kind of the typically yellow tassel at the top, is the male part of the plant. And then where the ear develops, it has green silks that grow out of it. And so on sweet corn, you peel it back a lot of times, you see the silks here. That's the female part of the plant. So they're on two different parts of the plant. It makes it pretty easy to eliminate the male and bring in pollen from another male and pollinate that plant. And so that's why corn really had the biggest advancements from the hybridization is because it was a lot easier to manipulate than, say, wheat, which pollinates right together. It flowers in the head. And so it's very hard to eliminate the male pollen to fertilize the female part of the wheat head. And when you look at broadleaf crops, it's typically the same way. They have flowers, sometimes very small flowers that contain both the male and female parts. So it's, it's very challenging to hybridize those types of plants, whereas corn, it's, it's much more readily manipulated in that way. Corn was hybridized back in the early 1900s. In fact, uh, Pioneer was started in the 1920s and it was based on the discovery of heterosis or hybrid vigor in seed corn and you could take two inbred parents that maybe yielded 10, 20 bushel per acre, make the cross and all of a sudden you saw 50, 60 bushel per acre. In today's production fields we have inbred parents that maybe yield 70, 80, 90, 100 bushel 
we cross two inbreds together and we get hybrids that can create 200, 300 bushel per acre. So that phenomenon is called heterosis or hybrid vigor and we built our corn industry on that phenomenon. If you look at the output of the production, uh, we're producing more bushels or a bushel with less fertilizer, less water than what we used to require, you know, even, even 10, 20 years ago. I started my career in 1983 and at my home farm in Nebraska, our dryland corn was 50 bushel per acre target, the irrigated was 150. Today, if you go back to the same farm, the goal for dryland corn is like 100 and 120 bushel and the irrigated is 200 to 250 bushel. And a lot of that is due to the genetic progress as well as you know, better management of the crop uh, to control the weeds, to, uh, to, to keep the water in the soil through no-till, conservation tillage. About 20 years ago, a new term came about when we talked about corn, GMO. What's GMO? Genetically modified organism. And it is pretty much what the name says. They took genes that were available out in nature and they took those out of naturally occurring plants and they put those in the corn plant so that the corn plant could have now a natural control of pests or a natural resistance to pests or a natural resistance to bad weather. They literally looked for genes that were in weeds or crops that flourished in those situations and they put that into the corn so that the corn could have those same traits. Yeah, in corn, in genetic improvement, uh, we're, we're using several different approaches. One is to mine the native diversity that we find in corn that just comes from uh, different regions of the country, different regions of the world where we have a lot of diversity. And we actually now can fingerprint the genetics of the chromosomes in that corn and look at the segregating progeny from the cross of two individuals. We can actually select the individuals that have the ideal genes for the key diseases, uh, insects, uh, the yield for that particular area by tracking those genes in the corn. And to me, this is engineering of the new corn hybrids that we're going to sell in the future. But we also have the capability of targeting specific genes that maybe give us protection to an in, uh, important insect. And we actually maybe be able to take that from uh, a different crop or maybe a bacteria. We can take the gene out and actually insert it into corn and get expression of a protein that doesn't exist in native corn. And this is oftentimes called GM for genetically modified or GMO for genetically modified organism. And it's offered tremendous new opportunities to increase the productivity of the crop, the uh, insect resistance of the crop, the disease resistance of the crop, taking us beyond where we could go with the native diversity. And so essentially what genetically modified corn is, is corn that contains genes from other organisms that are put into the corn to really help with production challenges that growers are facing and, and they're having a hard time managing with conventional type corns. And these proteins that are identified are the genes that create the proteins are extremely thoroughly tested. They go through many, many years of of safety testing. We, we feed the protein to fish, to birds, to, to rodents to, to test the impact. If it has any negative impact, we'll, we'll know that. We test it against the known allergens that exist to make sure that it doesn't uh, match any of those. In fact, the, the products that we introduce with these engineered genes are the most thoroughly tested products that we've ever commercialized in our company. And they're very safe. We introduced the first traits about 15 years ago. Uh, across the U.S. and across the world, and there's not been a single safety or health incident due to any of the crops that uh, have been genetically engineered. A lot of people are concerned that there are pesticides in the genetically modified corn as well, and that is absolutely not the case. And in fact, one of the largest advantages to genetically modified corn is that it enables growers to have less reliance on pesticides. Uh, whether that be insecticides or possibly using herbicides that are more effective and less harmful to humans or the environment. Right. In fact, if you look at corn, one of the big success stories in engineered corn is the BT technology. And it gives us outstanding resistance for the number one pest in the U.S., which is the European corn borer. And it actually came from a bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis that produces a protein that was very effective in controlling insects in organic gardens. 
and that particular pesticide has been used for many years by organic gardeners because that, that protein or pesticide is so safe. And we actually isolated that same exact gene and put it into corn to create just the right amount of, of expression of that protein to control the corn borer. And it's really increased yields dramatically in, in areas that have that insect. When we talk about breeding corn, we worry about from time to time, is anyone watching these plant breeders? Is there any sort of an aspect or a standard that has to be met? There absolutely is. There's three groups or three governmental agencies that have to be satisfied on each of their own set of standards. First of all, USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture has their set of standards. FDA, Food and Drug Administration has their set of standards and the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, has their set of standards as well. All three have their standards that have to be met before any of the GMO or hybridized corn can be released to the farmers to be raised. It's important to understand that genetically modified corn is very highly regulated and has to go through a very rigorous deregulation process to be commercially available. And so what the deregulation process really consists of is government agencies look at this product and they determine that it is both effective and safe. And only once do they determine that it is effective in what it was meant to do, as well as being safe and not having any negative effects on either humans, animals, or the environment as a whole, then and only then is it deregulated and available for commercial use. Testing of these crops is, is monitored and regulated by several agencies, including the EPA uh, and the USDA within the United States, you know, has uh, jurisdiction on the dissemination or control of the spread of those crops. And the EPA uh, is involved in the stewardship of some of these genes, such as the insect resistance. We, we have refuge areas that don't contain that crop in order to keep that gene's effectiveness intact because in Mother Nature, there's usually resistance that develops to uh, good genes for insects or disease resistance. And you'll get some insects that used to be controlled but are now resistant. So by doing good stewardship, working with the EPA, we can preserve these technologies for many years into the future because it offers tremendous value to our customers and ultimately to the consumer. They really have nothing to fear. Um, a genetically modified corn goes through the, the very rigorous deregulation process and only when it's determined to be very safe for humans and animals and, and not have any health risks involved in it, only then is it deregulated. And if, if there's anything wrong with it, I'll be the first to know because <laughs> I eat a handful of corn out of every field I walk, I think. So. <laughs> When you talk about corn, it isn't very long before the discussion of high fructose corn syrup comes up. Oh my gosh, what is high fructose corn syrup? Well, it's corn sweetener. But the reality is, is it's highly used through much of the U.S.'s food supply because it's inexpensive. But sugar, whether it's corn syrup or it's cane sugar, is still sugar. And sugar amounts to calories, and we all should watch the amount of sugar that we are consuming and therefore the amount of calories that we're consuming. High fructose corn syrup is essentially um, basically when we take corn and we isolate those starches and we develop what is called high fructose corn syrup. And so you have three types of sugars. There's glucose, sucrose, and fructose. And ba all, all those sugars are based off of glucose. And high fructose corn syrup is just sugars that have multiple glucose uh, molecules in them and so they're the same thing as sugar, they just contain more sugar and so they tend to be sweeter, which allows us to, to have a more concentrated sweet product that we can add to other items and increase the sweetness of those products. With respect to sugars, we probably all eat too much sugar, but for me, for me uh, I have no preference of whether it's cane sugar or high fructose corn sugar. I see them as nutritionally uh, equivalent, so I, I don't see any, any difference there. Let's talk about the uses of corn. In general, on an average year, about 30% of the corn is used for livestock feed. That would include for chickens and turkeys and hogs and cattle. About 30% is used for ethanol production. 
and about 30% is exported. And of course, that's going to vary from year to year on the, what the prices are and competitive products are as well. That other 10%, if you're doing the math, is used for high fructose corn syrup and corn oil and industrial uses of the starch for biodegradable plastics. Biodegradable plastics have been on the increase and many times when you see a biodegradable plastic, that is made from the starch of the corn. From, from a, a food perspective, corn is very important in making meat. It's the number one food ingredient for, for pork production, for beef production, for poultry production. Really, corn is a, a great feedstock for those. So from a food perspective, that's how corn is used the most, is to, is to be a feed for these different animals or birds. With respect to the, the uses of specific hybrids, we do characterize those during the development process and we can quantify how much fermentable starch a particular hybrid has, which would influence which ones would work best for the ethanol industry because that's starch is uh, the, the key ingredient to create the ethanol. And we do label certain hybrids as being high total fermentable or HTF. Uh, type of hybrids and uh, for any other specific uses for for feeds we'll look at the protein and the oil content of that specific uh, hybrid and the grain that it produces and some are more ideal than others and so sometimes it's a compromise of how much yield you get versus the quality of the yield that you get as to how ideal or uh, or which one that that particular user or customer would choose to use. As you think about corn, we're really, for the most part, producing carbohydrates. And so carbohydrates are made of carbon and hydrogen. And when you think of petroleum products, essentially petroleum products are carbon and hydrogen. So we can manipulate these molecules into corn to do a lot of the things that we're doing with petroleum products right now. And when we're doing that, we're using a green renewable resource to do that versus using the petroleum products. Yeah, a lot of the biodegradable plastics are utilizing a cornstarch polymer within the production of that plastic, and it will degrade much, much quicker than any petroleum-based uh, plastic. And I think we're seeing more and more of that, and it's good for the environment uh, to be able to break those plastics down quicker. When we talk about corn, we have to talk about the socioeconomic issues that come with corn. Do increased yields have a positive effect on the world or a negative effect on the world? This point of view needs to be brought out, is that when we produce more on every acre of farmland in the United States, we feed more people on that acre. As we feed more people on that acre, that means less environmentally sensitive land that has to be farmed around the world. We can do that with better efficiency. We need less fertilizer per bushel, and less pesticides per bushel and less water per bushel because the entire crop is a more efficient use of the inputs that we've had available for many years. When we increase yield, what it does for the country is, is it adds to our gross domestic product. Um, what we're doing in agriculture is essentially we're harvesting sunlight and so it is a renewable resource. We're generating products from the sun, the air, the soil and so it, it is a very important natural resource to the country. Uh, it generates uh, income, um, essentially from the sunlight. And so the more yield that we can generate, the more income we can, we can generate from our farms and add to the economy as a whole. If you think about how are we going to feed those people on a global basis, we think the most important opportunity is to increase the yield on those very good acres, the acres that are really beautiful for, produ for producing crops, rather than taking out fragile acres, maybe rainforest or you know, areas that are wetlands and, and have been forced to use those acres for production, we can use those beautiful uh, acres that just do a great job of producing crops. There's a really important point on conservation and what has happened with the genetic engineering and corn improvement. We've made corn uh, such that we can spray specialized herbicides that are very safe, low volume herbicides that have very good weed control. We had to put that resistance gene into the plant because it didn't exist in nature. What it's allowed, to do, allowed us to do is to use no-till, where we can leave the residue 
the insulation of residue on the surface. It allows the moisture to stay in the ground where it's needed. It also keeps the, the soil from blowing away with wind and water erosion. When I grew up on a farm 30 years ago, we would have tremendous erosion when we would plow and disc the ground. We'd get a rain and, and the, the water would just be brown from soil washing away. Today, on those same acres with minimum till, no till, when a rain happens, the water actually goes into the ground and that that does run off is much clearer with a lot less soil than what you would have seen 20 or 30 years ago. And that was enabled by traits that have been delivered into the corn plant for better disease resistance, um, better weed control systems, and it's really revolutionized farming. That's a wrap up for this episode of Real Ag. We hope that the information presented here will help you understand the scientific advances that go into the food you eat. On behalf of the Real Ag crew, I'm Kyle Bauer, helping you sort the truth and helping you understand Real Ag. Production of Real Ag is made possible in part by an underwriting grant from Kansas Soybean Commission, the Soybean Checkoff. It works for everyone.